So uh, you are here today for preparing for extreme weather, fire, and hurricane. I'm going to do a couple of quick introduction slides, and then we're going to go ahead and jump into the program. Again, my name is Robin bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C CARE Coordinator. And you just heard from Mike Morneau, our senior producer at Learning Times. If you have any questions during the webinar, I encourage you to go uh, into the chat box to communicate with us at any point. We do have our home on the web, which is connecting to collections.org. Um, on that website, you will be able to see a history of the program. So on that website, you will see an archive of our, all of our courses, all of our webinars, um, a link to our online community. So there you can ask questions of conservation professionals who will answer them. Direct care questions are always encouraged on that community. You also see curated resources and a bunch of other information. So I encourage you to go to that website whenever you're able to. We also have two places you can go check out news about us on social media, which is on Facebook and Twitter. So I encourage you to follow both those feeds if you're able to. And as Mike said, you have two ways to communicate with us. One is via the chat box. That is to say, hello, tell us how the weather's going, say where you're from. Uh, any of those things can happen within the chat box. Within the Q&A box, that's where you can ask questions from our speakers today. Um, I encourage you to put a question at any point during the actual program. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll hit you when you're hearing a presentation. So feel free to put a question in at that time. And you will be, we'll be able to hit as many as we can during the Q&A period yeah. afterwards. A couple of quick programming notes um, is the upcoming webinars. So we have two free webinars that are coming up in the next couple months. One is fundraising for collections care that's happening on September 28th. And then on October 11th, we have forget the best good and better approaches to preservation. That one we're partnering with our friends over at CCAHA for. For the upcoming webinars, the uh, they're free. So I encourage you to go to our website and sign up for them as soon as you're able to. They are open for reserve, uh, they're open for registration as of today. So go to our website to see them at any point. We also have an upcoming course, which I think um, I wanted to talk a little bit about today. That one's called The Preservation of Our Global Photographic Heritage Here, There, and Everywhere. That's going to be running from September 13th to September 27th. Now, the courses are a little bit more of an in-depth look at a subject. Um, C2C Care does charge for them, but if you register before Saturday, August 20th, you'll get an early bird fee. So it's going to be a five webinar course. Um, another really neat thing about this course is that it actually, we're going to be loaning you, or the course coordinator is going to be loaning you a collection of photographs to actually have that you can use during the course. Um, and then you'll be asked to mail them back at the end of it. She's handling that. Her name is Deborah Nora. She's a great instructor from the University of Delaware. So if you're interested in the course, I would encourage you to sign up for it as soon as we can. It actually has a maximum of 50 participants. So if you're interested, please get in there as soon as you can. We're pretty excited about it. Now, today's topic, extreme weather. Um, when we started planning this a few months ago, which was back in the spring, I mean, obviously we knew hurricane season and fire season were coming up, but I don't think any of us really expected it to be quite the experience of what the summer has been, obviously. There's been quite a lot of disasters in the Southeast, out West, um, different parts of the country and different parts of the world. So before we started, we did wanna pass along some resources. Um, I'm also gonna encourage everyone to send resources in the chat. So if you know the local resource that you found helpful during an emergency or disaster preparedness or preparing for extreme weather, like we're talking about today, I encourage you to put those resources in the chat and we will try to gather them all at the end of this session. Um, I did wanna pass along the, the National Heritage Responders line, which is important here at FAIC to pass along. There's an email helpline to help people. There's also a 24 hour man phone number, which is at 202-661-8068. And also a general email address that you can use in case you're dealing with a disaster or anything else. Uh, FAIC has also allocated a certain amount of funds to help out with emergency CAPS, which are the conservation assessment program. So if you're interested in that program where someone will come out and actually help you kind of prioritize and write a report to deal with an emergency situation, um, I would encourage you to go check out that website down there. One other thing before we start our program is that we are going to be talking about some sensitive subjects today, um, dealing with extreme weather and disasters and all that can 
it can be traumatic and it can be quite upsetting. Um, I know, you know, some of you might know I dealt with Hurricane Irma on a personal level back in 2015. I was displaced for a month. It was quite scary to know kind of what was happening at that point. Other people have been displaced either from their personal lives or their institutional lives for uh, weather or disaster situations. So we just wanted to ask you to keep that in mind while we're talking about our presentations today. Um, we do hope that we'll pass along some great resources to everyone, but just be aware of the fact that, you know, sensitive subjects and we're gonna be kind to our audience and presenters. So I'm gonna go ahead and do some quick introductions of our presenter today. Um, the first section of our webinar is gonna be covering some of the fires that happened out in California a couple of years ago. Our presenters for that section are first Jenny Daly, who's a museum curator one at California State Park, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz District, excuse me. And then Kathleen Aston, who's the collections manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And then later in the program, we're gonna be hearing from Shakira Teresa Santiago, who's the museum collections manager down at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, and that one's gonna be dealt about hurricane. Once those are done, we will then go into a Q&A session afterwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna go ahead and ask for Jenny to go ahead and get started. She's our first presenter today. Jenny, feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. Can everybody see that okay? Looks perfect, go right ahead. Great. So hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jenny Daly. I'm the Museum Curator One for California State Parks um, in the Santa Cruz District. First, I would like to say thank you to Robin and for connecting to Collections Care for inviting me to present my museum collections evacuation story today. Um, I'm honored to be here. And thank you to everyone who's watching as this is a very important topic. Um, just a brief bit about me and my background. I received my master's in museum studies with an emphasis on collections management from John F. Kennedy University in 2010. Before working for parks, I worked in more traditional museum settings like the California Academy of Sciences, Cantor Arts Center at Stanford University, and the Getty in LA. Um, but I started working for state parks in October of 2019. And I went for the curator job at State Parks because it just seemed like such a rather unique position. And it's a place where I can combine my love of parks with my expertise as a museum collection in museum collections management. And, you know, I imagine most of you are pretty savvy about museums, but perhaps you may not immediately associate the state parks with museum collections. In the Santa Cruz district, we have about 15 parks that have either historic artifact collections, historic house museums, historic structures, and or a visitor center with some type of collections on display. We probably have about 15, I would say only 15,000 cataloged individual museum collection items, um, but that number is much larger when you start to include the archeology span collections and of course, all of the uncatalogued material. So the focus of the webinar today is how extreme weather impacts cultural institutions. But I wanted to start with this image because this is a photo of my backyard on the day before I had to evacuate my home during the CZU fire in August of 2020. I live up in the Santa Cruz mountains and the fire got within a mile of our house on three sides. So. I wanna emphasize that in addition to an extreme weather event affecting your professional life, an extreme weather event and or emergency will probably also be affecting your personal life in some way. Um, we got the order to evacuate at 2 a.m. and had to load up our cars with our pets and photos and food and clothes and get out in a hurry. Uh, I spent an entire day trying to find a secure place to stay with my pets um, and that was a day that I couldn't help my coworkers with fire evacuations. And ultimately, I ended up being evacuated from home for five weeks. So just some background on the CZU fire. Uh, in the early morning hours of Sunday, August 16th, 2020, which means we just got to the two year anniversary, um, an uncharacteristic dry lightning storm sparked numerous fires across portions 
of Northern Santa Cruz County and Southern San Mateo County. By late Tuesday of August 18th, changes in weather conditions resulted in multiple smaller fires joining and merging and turning into this out of control conflagration. Collectively known as the CZU Lightning Complex Fire, it ultimately burned 86,000, over 86,000 acres, destroyed 1,500 structures and burned for 37 days. So here's a map that shows the extent of the CZU fire. The pink area is the extent of the fire and the areas in green are our local state parks within the Santa Cruz district, which is a combination of Santa Cruz and San Mateo counties. This rugged coastal mountain area is south of San Francisco and north of the city of Santa Cruz and bordered, on the, bordered by the Pacific Ocean to the west and Skyline Ridge to the east. And so here, um, here are the six parks in the Santa Cruz district that were affected by the fire. The level of impact varies from park to park. Um, for example, Big Basin Redwood State Park was burned, 97% of the park was burned and all of the historic buildings and museum collections were destroyed in that park. Meanwhile, neighboring Portola Redwood State Park was barely touched by the fire. But during the fire response, with the exception of Big Basin, museum collections were evacuated from five state park units to avoid any further damage and destruction to important cultural resources. Um, and so in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about our response to the fire and the collections evacuation efforts at each one of these parks. And so I, I also, again, wanna give a content warning here that some of the images show extensive fire damage to museum collection spaces and museum collections. Um, and then also I just wanna note all the images in this presentation were taken by me. So Big Basin State Park was established in 1902. It's our oldest state park in California. Big Basin is known for its old growth redwood trees, camping, hiking, and waterfalls. The buildings in the historic core of the park were built by the California Conservation Corps in the 1930s as part of a WPA era initiative. Um, here's an image of our archive room in the back of the museum before the fire. Uh, this was our main storage room for this park. And although items were stored in at least three different buildings, um, and exhibitions were on display in at least two different buildings. And here's an image of the museum after the fire. So at 9 p.m. on Tuesday, which was August 18th, I received a text from my boss, who's the supervisor of cultural resources. And he was asking questions about evacuating museum collections at Big Basin that he could then relay to the rangers who were the only people that were still in the park at that point. Um, so you see the, uh, the museum building at Big Basin had just been renovated <laughs> and at least half of the collections were still packed in boxes from being temporarily relocated during the renovations. So I advised my boss, the rangers should at least grab what was stored in boxes. Um, you know, at that point, I didn't know how much damage and destruction there would be at Big Basin. Um, we didn't get confirmation until a day or two later that not only had none of the collections been evacuated, but that all of the buildings and collections had been a total loss. So in a different park at Rancho Del Oso, um, that's the area of Big Basin that is um, where Waddell Creek meets the Pacific Ocean. Um, and this is an image of our collection storage room at Rancho Del Oso. And Rancho Del Oso has also a historic house, which has a nature and history center. And there's a small welcome center across the marsh. And miraculously, both of these buildings did survive despite the fire coming within 10 feet of building, the buildings. And this is an image of our museum collections in transport. So the, the parks interpreter and a park ranger packed most of the contents of the museum collection storage room 
into this large van. And then maintenance staff then packed the taxidermy and museum objects that were on display in the visitor center room and the welcome center. And they put them in their vehicles and took everything to a nearby park. Um, and they took it over to Año Nuevo State Park, which is across the highway. And so then a couple days later, I was concerned that Año Nuevo may also still be in danger from the fire. Um, so I met with the interpreter. We caravaned up to Año Nuevo, went through the highway patrol um, roadblocks on Highway 1, and went up and picked up the van full of collections and drove it back to Santa Cruz for safekeeping. And it, it ended up, this van full of collections ended up being in Santa Cruz for about six weeks. So the Cultural Preserve at Wilder Ranch State Park is a collection of numerous historic houses, barns, and outbuildings. The oldest structure is the Balkoff Adobe, which was built in the 1830s. Uh, but most of the structures were built by the Meter and Wilder families between the 1860s and 1940s, including three houses, a horse barn, a cow barn, workshops, and other buildings. And this is an image of one of the collection storage areas in the park after the evacuations. Uh, the museum collections are stored in various locations throughout the preserve, and there are collections both on display and in storage. And there's about 6,000 individual objects in this park. Um, so I spent all day here along with interpretive staff, a handful of docents, and a couple of cultural resources staff who came down from Sacramento. And we packed the entire contents of the museum collection storage room here in the Victorian in this image, um, as well as most of the small objects on display in the houses and workshops. Many of the items were packed into staff vehicles and moved across um, to the Santa Cruz Mission State Historic Park, which is about two miles away. Um, and we also packed all of the accession records because those are stored at Wilder Ranch, as well as as much reference material and everything in my office was also packed up and moved to the mission. And then so by midday of that day that we were packing, which is what this is an image of, um, two moving trucks arrived from that had been sent down from Sacramento and with movers, which was very helpful. Um, and so we then started to pack up as much of the large furniture as we could fit into the into at least one of the trucks. We also started to pack up tools and equipment from the workshops. Most of that stuff is original Wilder family material. Um, and then we just tried to find as many collections and storage as we could throughout all of the various buildings and pack as much as we could. Um, and then when these two trucks were full, they, they left and went back up to Sacramento. You know, so this was a point where we had already realized the losses at Big Basin. And so we were very motivated to try to save as much material at Wilder. We knew that the fire was moving into the upper reaches of the park. And so we weren't sure if the cultural preserve would survive. So the next park is Henry Cowell Redwood State Park. It's a beautiful Redwood Park. Um, and it's also the location of our district headquarters. Um, the park's visitor center has objects on display, and then the district archaeology collections are stored in the maintenance area. And so this is an image of our archaeology collections being returned to the lab um, nearly a year after the fires. Uh, so, the, so at Henry Cowell, the park interpreter and other staff packed up everything on display that they could in the visitor center and evacuated them to a nearby park. And then our district cultural team met with those two moving trucks and filled up one of the trucks with as many of the archaeology collection storage boxes as possible. Um, also, they filled up the truck with our um, park unit files and with research material that had been collected over probably the past 20 years. 
and just tried to get as much of that documentation packed up and evacuated as possible. And so here's an image of us reinstalling the mountain lion um, in the visitor center at Henry Cowell. So, you know, after the fire danger had passed, the interpreters and I, you know, spent time returning the evacuated collections back to many of the visitor centers and staging them for cleaning, reinstallation, and inventory, which was done over a few months. So Año Nuevo was another park affected by the fire. Um, it's also on the coast, just north of Rancho del Oso. These days, it's mostly known for its elephant seal colony, but the parkland was once part of the steel family dairy. And this is an image of a small steel family cemetery that's located at Cascade Ranch, which unfortunately suffered quite a bit of damage, including that broken headstone. And so staff in this part packed the taxidermy, skulls, ethnograph ethnographic collections, and everything as much as they could that was on display in the barn and evacuated it to the mission for safe storage. And um, fortunately, the historic structures in the cultural complex at Anya survived the damage, despite the fire crossing Highway 1 at multiple points. However, this area, Cascade Ranch, was not quite so lucky. Uh, a historic barn and a couple of other buildings were destroyed in the fire. And unfortunately, a few museum collections had been stored in those barns as well. So at Butano, State Park. Here's an image of the visitor center. And you can see that precariously hanging ceiling tile that was damaged during the evacuation because there had been an owl hanging from the ceiling that was um, evacuated in haste and damaged the ceiling. And um, fortunately, cultural and maintenance staff were able to pack up most of the taxidermy and ethnographics that are on display in this visitor center. And most of the items were also taken to the mission for safe storage. And here's Portola Redwood State Parks. And this is an image of us reinstalling another taxidermy mountain lion specimen. Um, you know, in this park, the fire only burned to the edge of the park, but and fortunately not much farther, but um, the collections on display were evacuated, again, just out of an abundance of caution. Natural resources staff packed most of the taxidermy and objects on display in the visitor center and took them to the Half Moon Bay State Park maintenance yard. And so months later, I worked with maintenance staff, as you can see here, to reinstall this mountain lion. And we devised a new um, quick release security mount so that the specimen could be easily removed from the wall in the next evacuation if necessary. So this is an image of me sifting through the debris at Big Basin, looking for museum collections to salvage. Um, by late September of 2020, a large team of cultural resources staff, along with staff from Sacramento and staff from one of our cooperating associations, the Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks, we all headed up to Big Basin to survey and record the damage and destruction of the historic structures. And at that time, I was able to spend some time looking through the ashes in our various storage locations, you know, to look for any collections that may have survived. And I was able to find about 50 or so individual items, as you can see here, um, mostly logging equipment, axe heads, saw blades. So as you can imagine, it's mostly sturdy metal objects that survived the fire. Um, and these salvaged collections were headed, were, were moved to our district headquarters at Henry Cowell for temporary storage. We also, after the fire danger had passed, had the opportunity to do a deep clean of our exhibition spaces since they were largely empty of their artifacts. In the months after the fire, with the help of interpretive staff, docents, and other volunteers, we spent about 12 full working days doing a deep clean of exhibition spaces and storage spaces at about seven parks.
And so then began the process of returning collections. Um, about a week after the fire, the very first thing we returned is that car in the image on the left. Um, we're returning it to the garage at Wilder Ranch. Um, so I worked, basically I worked at the mission where most of the uh, evacuated collections ended up. And I started organizing all of the collections, you know, sorting, since the mission has multiple rooms, I sort of sorted all of the collections from one park into each room. And um, most of the objects from Wilder ended up in one of our rooms that's just basically reserved for showing an interpretive video. So it's practically an empty room. And that was really fortunate because we were able to just fill it with evacuated collections. Um, over the following months, I worked with our interpretive staff to begin returning the evacuated collections to various parks. We used our state park trucks to move everything that had been stored at the mission, um, including the many boxes, some furniture and large paintings that we took from Wilder Ranch. Items were staged in visitor centers and in the historic house so that they could be inventory cleaned and then returned to their storage and display locations. And then in January 2021, a moving truck returned the Wilder collections that had been in Sacramento. It was one full truck <laughs> full of furniture. Um, and this is the image on the right. Um, the returned collections included the furniture from the houses, the packed exhibition display objects, museum collections from storage, machines and tools from the workshops. And I worked with these two movers to help place the furniture back in the houses. And the box collections were again staged in one of the, one of the houses to be returned to storage later. Um, eventually it took me months to unpack and restore everything. Some of the items like a drill press and lathe that were in the workshop required the help of knowledgeable docents who knew how to reassemble them and very strong maintenance staff who could then um, place them back in their uh, original locations. Um, and so by June of 2020, 2021, excuse me, another moving company returned two more full truckloads of our archeology span collections that had been temporarily stored in Sacramento and we brought them back to our archeology span lab at Henry Cowell. So in conclusion, so what are the lessons that we learned here? You know, in the pros column, I learned that many park staff are willing to pitch in and help with evacuation, evacuations of collections in an emergency. I learned that the Santa Cruz Mission is a great temporary storage location, uh, at least during the time of the CZU fire evacuations, because it was also peak COVID times and the mission was close to the public. Um, and another pro was that we had this opportunity to do a deep clean of our exhibition spaces and of the actual objects on display. Oh, and then this image on the left is the room at the mission where that we packed full of the Wilder collections. Um, so some of the cons were that I think maybe we evacuated more than we needed to. I know that it was all an abundance of caution, but um, specifically with the taxidermy, I think we should have first focused on evacuating the endangered species specimens. And then if there had been more time, get more items. Um, we did tend to focus on evacuating items that were on display and some of the core collections in storage did get missed. Um, this was primarily because we just didn't have prepared lists of priority objects with locations ready for evacuation. And then some of the taxidermy and some of the other one or two other artifacts were damaged during the evacuation. This image on the right is the one of the taxidermy owls that was damaged. You can see its head is maybe not quite in the right position anymore. Um, and so then we had to send that to um, conservator for repair. And so 
the most important lesson we learned, I learned, was the value of having up-to-date evacuation plans, having priority items identified in advance, having a cache of emergency collection supplies for packing, um, having objects and storage already identified and, in, and packed in boxes and ready to go, and having locations identified in advance for temporary storage of evacuated collections. And my thanks go out to all my state parks colleagues who helped, who pitched in and helped during the fires. Um, here's a picture of us at the mission. We're flexing our muscles after returning a load of boxes back to Wilder Ranch. Um, and so that's it for me. Um, thank you. And now I'll pass it over to Kathleen. And she's going to talk about the same fire event um, from the perspective of her museum and how, the, how they engaged with the community during the event. So let me well, stop sharing. <laughs> um, thank you, Jenny. Uh, and I will start sharing. Okay, so can everyone see that all right? Yes, it looks great. Thanks, Kathleen. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so um, Jenny and I have talked about this um, narrative and the lessons that we learned and our takeaways a lot, but it's still a pretty impactful story. So I really appreciate you being willing to share that out. I know that it was a pretty difficult experience for you. Um, so I um, am Kathleen Aston. I'm the collections manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Um, we are neighbors of the Santa Cruz District of State Parks um, with whom we frequently collaborate on a bunch of different projects. Um, we did not suffer the kind of collections losses that Jenny just described at Big Basin and elsewhere, but we were impacted by the extreme weather events that culminated in the CZ Lightning complex fires. For my portion of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about some of these impacts and lessons learned. Um, while Jenny was presenting, I was able to keep a little bit of an eye on the chat. So I'm gonna to try to maybe speak to some of the questions that are happening, um, but I'm sure we'll have time for that at the end. Um, about our sort of, you know, trial and evacuating things so that we didn't suffer so in hopes that we wouldn't suffer losses. Um, and then I'm going to focus more on how the fires impacted our sort of collections development and acquisition practices. Um, so kind of echoing some things that um, Jenny talked about, it's really important to emphasize when you're dealing with disasters, first making sure that staff um, are safe and sound. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, a lot of folks are going to be unable to participate in an emergency response due to personal reasons, like if they've been injured, evacuated, or are caring for loved ones. Um, but the one thing that kind of surprised me in the case of extreme fire weather type situations, um, something I just didn't think about, many people in the Santa Cruz area just had to leave town in order to be able to breathe. Um, good thing we already all had masks. Um, but the weather was just really bad and a lot of folks had to go. Um, so I was super fortunate in that I was not impacted in my physical health and housing, um, but I was impacted emotionally. Um, you can see in this photo, the picture from my front yard around mid morning, a few days into the fires. And ironically, one of my tasks that month was to add to the, the um, first iteration of more collections focused content to our institutional emergency plan, which at the time didn't have anything speaking specifically to the collections. And I was actually writing that content when the sky turned orange and ash started falling outside my window. Um, and I was thinking a lot about emergency preparedness resources like the management cycle illustrated here and the disaster response wheel. Um, and I will never quite forget the experience of setting those things aside on my computer um, and getting up and starting to take pictures of my room, making sure I had significant documents and supplies and packed in a bag and gas in my car. Um, so I was thinking a lot about these management phases. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with them, but I just wanna cover them briefly for some context about the way that sort of my content for the presentation fits into kind of preparedness. Um, so you have mitigation, which is doing what you can ahead of time to minimize the impact of disasters. Preparedness, which is the immediate actions you take to get ready for an impending disaster. Response, which is the first 72 hours of reacting to a disaster and recovery which is the months and years and decades of processing the disaster's impact. Um, so I had been really focusing on making sure our plan had good response type content. Um, my greatest concern was that we really had no guidance on salvage. Um, and because our collections were not directly impacted by the fires, we didn't have to take advantage of that content that I wrote. Um, we did, however, realize the importance of some of the other components um, through our experience with evacuation, um, which, uh, 
we'll all talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so it really, uh, it seemed unreal that the fires would be able to get to us. Um, we're in the heart of a historic and relatively central neighborhood in Santa Cruz. Um, but, you know, in just prior years, there were several towns and cities throughout California where fires had unexpectedly made it to the hearts of historic downtowns. Um, and we didn't want to wait until the fires got close um, to decide when it was time to move things. But we also realized we did not have a metric for what this meant. Um, like, you know, uh, I haven't seen this a lot in the literature that I was looking at, what it really means to identify the disasters that might impact your community and museum and when exactly short of flames at your doors, it's time to go. Um, it takes a lot of resources to make, to, you know, relocate items and we couldn't expend those, you know, at the wrong time or we didn't want to have to deal with that. Um, and we also had to think about who makes the call. Is it myself as the collections manager? Is it our operations director? Is it our executive director? Um, so we ended up determining that once any collections holding area was immediately adjacent to an active evacuation zone, CAL FIRE order, organizes communities into different evacuation zones and there are um, evacuation warnings and then there are active evacuation orders. And so once um, collections items were stored immediately adjacent to an active evacuation zone that had been ordered to evacuate, the executive director would inform collection staff that it was time um, for us to relocate items. Um, and so this is something that we have institutionalized into our emergency plan now. Um, and we're thinking about what that looks like for other potential disasters like tsunami warnings and things like this. Um, so uh, this ultimately we did end up needing to re uh, relocate items at our offsite storage location. Um, and so our priority items list, a snippet of which you can see on the screen was incredibly important part of this process. I noticed a lot of you talking about, you know, kind of like how to decide and like objects versus records and these sorts of things. Um, it's really important to write out this list of priority items. And this is something that was emphasized in a lot of the literature or is emphasized and something that really rang true to our experience. Um, and in one of those ways, you know, most of our priority items are in our main collections storage space on site at our museum. But writing this list forced me to articulate the priority level of items that have historically been held at our offsite storage unit. And that I have not yet had much of the opportunity to work with, so I don't think about them as much. Um, I will also say that the items we ended up evacuating from our offsite storage unit are um, a selection of items that technically belongs to sort of a local history kind of community. Um, they are not explicitly ours, but we're stewarding them. We're working with that group to come up with a stewardship agreement. Um, but in that way, they kind of function <clears throat> like loans do, where they have like a special priority because we're holding these kind of in trust for other folks. Um, and while they weren't at our main storage facility, they were something we wanted to make sure um, were kept safe. Um, so ultimately, the fires did not impact the storage unit where we were holding these, but they could have. Um, in thinking through the evacuation, we had to brainstorm where to put things. Um, so one thing that was really helpful is that storage unit is organized all into boxes with items on rolling shelving units. So we were able to just like pull that out. Um, the boxes are numbered. We relocated about 13 bankers boxes worth of materials. Um, all told, it took about four hours to you know, go get them, relocate them, make sure everything had like an up-to-date inventory list, list and things like this. Um, and uh, one thing you had to think about too is where to put things. Um, so it's important, uh, one big takeaway when you consider your planning is that most semi-public or public spaces that might be used for collections relocation will likely be taken up by people and emergency supplies. Um, because we're really small, um, we rely in part on public storage units. Um, and we were able to temporarily relocate items from our collection storage unit to an event and education supplies unit that was further away from the evacuation zones. Um, we articulated but did not have to use our next possible location, which was the executive director's home even further um, down the coast. It was critical that our executive director, Felicia Van Stolk, who had a lot to do, including support several staff who had to be evacuated, be involved in this process so that we had buy-in and support. Um, throughout this experience, from working on our emergency plan to responding to an emergency to reviewing our responses, our board collections committee provided invaluable support and insight. So this is a photo of our larger board, but I work closely with a subset of these folks on our collections committee. Collections are super fun, so they're all generally pretty enthusiastic about the role, but I'm super grateful that several of them have become super invested in emergency planning, um, especially for smaller institutions who often have to call upon board members and volunteers for support. Cultivating an involved collections committee is an essential tool for responding to challenges at the emergency scale. 
Um, it can be if you're like thinking about building up a collections committee or some sort of advisory board, this is a task I think is a really good uh, thing to sort of farm out is the wrong word, but um, take them into collaboration on. Um, and so it was via our collections committee meeting discussion following the CZU fires that we solidified, you know, our understandings of how our process went, pros and cons, but also, you know, generated broader institutional and leadership level understanding so that we subsequently had support for efforts to make improvements to our practices. Like it was an easy approval for my boss and the board to say, yeah, Kathleen should be able to take this, you know, um, class in emergency preparedness to make sure that we're like capturing all these lessons correctly. Um, so uh, that's some stuff about emergency, like immediate our response to having to relocate items um, and then relocate them back because they were not impacted in the way that other local institutions and, and people were, um, which I can talk more about. Um, but we didn't think about this experience exclusively in the context of collections, evacuation and salvage. We also thought about it in terms of collection development or acquisitions. So for the remainder of my presentation, I'm gonna talk about the efforts we made to responsibly and ethically collect items related to the CZU lightning fires and the ways that our programming and partnerships positively impacted these goals. So part of preparing for extreme weather and disasters means finding ways to regularly engage your community over these issues, especially in light of increasing climate instability, which is I think something that even though we're a natural history museum, maybe is a bit more in our wheelhouse, I think that also affects everyone. Um, and so I consider these sorts of issues to be within the recovery section of the emergency management cycle, um, which does feed into all the other components of the cycle. So by the time our skies darkened from smoke in August of 2020, we had already experienced the unprecedented disaster of COVID. We'd already decided it was important to collect items that would help us tell that story, even if they weren't traditional natural history specimens, like this mask and this uh, vaccination sticker. Um, collecting in response to the fires was similarly complicated with related challenges of deciding how to acquire objects with sensitivity and how to make sure they made sense for our collections. Ultimately, we were inspired to move forward with this decision by a staff member who was evacuated during the fires. Um, our wonderful visitor engagement manager, Liz Broughton, who reached out even while evacuated to a hotel outside the area um, to press the issue of how we were going to collect CZU. So uh, we made sure to do our research and look around at how other institutions responded to disasters from a collecting perspective. As one example, here's some objects on the national level, um, uh, the Smithsonian Katrina collections, um, whose curators wrote papers on how they went about developing a collection that captured a super cataclysmic, painful, complicated event. Um, in our local community, we had institutions like the San Lorenzo Valley Museum, who were still providing ways to engage folks in their local history, writing this blog, for example, um, while the staff themselves were dealing with evacuations. Um, or the Museum of Art and History, um, who conducted interviews to give people a chance to share super personal stories of loss. Um, of course, these are just two examples among many, um, and a lot of folks were out there actively participating in um, emergency response efforts that were more people focused, like getting folks food, shelter, and information that they needed to deal with being evacuated and having their homes destroyed. Um, we especially wanted to think about what it made sense uh, for us to collect as a natural history museum. And this is something we found inspiration for in our own collections. We have a selection of items based on the locally devastating 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Items in this collection range from commemorative bricks um, to bumper stickers uh, to a rock that illustrates evidence of fault movement. These items, some of which are very non-traditional, have helped us connect with our community countless times from lectures on local natural disasters like the one featured here to our 2019 Loma Prieta commemorative exhibit, which is 30 years after the fact. Um, so synthesizing all this research experience and conversations with colleagues who were personally affected uh, by the fires, as well as considering our storage space constraints and our commitment to this natural history focus, we developed a priorities document to guide our collection efforts. So you can see an excerpt of that here. Um, we used this as a tool to communicate our project, not only through traditional outreach channels like social media, but also through personal networks. Um, we hope that these articulations demonstrated the thoughtfulness we wanted to bring to this collection um, and all of its difficulty. Um, responses were not overwhelming. Um, people had plenty to do, but it did work. Um, we acquired a variety of natural materials directly affected by the fires, including leaves, cones, and ash. And we had a number of people who expressed appreciation that that was something that we um, were interested in doing. 
uh, taking a further cue from that Loma Prieta collection I talked about, we also purchased some small items for the collection, including memorabilia whose creators were donating proceeds to local relief orgs um, or other groups. Um, and one example is the sticker by local artist Clara Spars, who gifted proceeds to the local Amamuts and tribal band to support their land trust and cultural burns program. Knowing that community networks are such a critical component of disaster recovery, we wanted to capture the incredible outpouring of community support related to this event. Um, I'm also really proud to say that our organization did more than just purchase stickers. Our executive director supported staff members to volunteer up to a certain number of hours at community emergency response efforts on work time, um, including sorting and distributing emergency supplies or taking calls at the CAL FIRE Information Center. Um, unexpectedly, this engagement also led to growth in our CZU fire collection, like the acquisition of several CAL FIRE operations maps charting the fire's development. I think this is an important example of the way that engaging with your community in times of crisis is always beneficial in more ways than one, especially when you um, want to enhance collections that speak to your community need. I think it's also a good example of the importance of collaboration across departments. Even in the context of a small staff, we're very small, it's too easy to get siloed. Um, and we deliberately communicated with staff about our interest in collecting CZU related objects and had some extensive talks about being sensitive to these difficulties, um, you know, talking about these kinds of things. Um, and it was in fact a non-collection staff member who was volunteering with CAL FIRE who took advantage of the opportunity to get these maps. Um, so I hope for some of you, this unexpected collection success story, as well as others that I'm about to share, provide you with concrete examples that you can use when advocating for community engagement and interdepartmental collaboration opportunities. So another good example of collections growth outside our deliberate CZU campaign was our community photography exhibit, 2020 Vision, in which community members were asked to submit photographs of their 2020 experiences for inclusion in a hybrid digital and virtual exhibit. So many of these images focused on aspects of the fire, such as the orange lighthouse afternoon on the first slide, the deep orange sky, this was like 4 p.m., maybe 3 p.m. Um, in this, uh, you know, uh, in this photo of the Santa Cruz town clock, or this image of Santa Cruz cypress cones opening in response to fire conditions. These images, as you can tell from me using them in this presentation, while not explicitly part of our CZU collection, continue to be useful points of illustration for the significance of the fires and our ongoing responses to them. So uh, speaking of ongoing responses, I will say that we did anticipate some ways that our like non-collections initiatives and programs were going to kind of add, expand to collections. Um, we just didn't initially focus on traditional notions of collections. Um, we have an ongoing CCU Lightning Complex community science project that empowers community scientists, uh, the average folks to collect biodiversity data from areas impacted by the fires. Um, this project, which uses the community science platform iNaturalist um, observations shown here on the slide um, is a joint project from UCSC's Kenneth Norris Center for Natural History and the California Native Plant Society. So it builds out a collection, so to speak, of data on the iNaturalist platform that is accessible to all from scientists to members of the public. Um, happily, these partnerships also fed into our interest in collecting specimens related to the CZU fire as it cultivated our relationship with CNPS staff who were able to collect for us partially open cones from the burn zone a place that you know most average folks, unless you have really explicit reasons to be there, weren't allowed to go. Um, these help us demonstrate the unique fire ecology adaptation where cones of some conifers open in response to fire conditions as pictured in one of the earlier slides. Um, closely tied to our science project was our CZU and U program series, the year after the fire a program series designed to promote an ongoing understanding of the fires, their effects, and what it means um, for people to be prepared on the central coast. Um, this program series was put together by our incredible public programs manager, Marisa Gomez, who you can see um, here in the screenshot of our CZU and new event that focused on community collections responses to the fires. It was through this program that I really first collaborated with Jenny um, and you know we like talked about the different kinds of lessons that we learned from our very different fire experiences. Um, so not only was this an excellent program that received a lot of positive feedback, I think it was really important, especially for folks in the community who experienced loss to hear about what that would look like on an institutional level. Um, it was an important opportunity to strengthen ties um, with local collection staff. 
which in turn also supported our collections. Jenny's experience talking about the impact of CZU at Big Basin included a discussion of burned taxidermy armatures from the former museum site. As the result of this productive partnership, Jenny not only became aware of our collecting interests, but also felt comfortable sharing these specimens with us. Specimens that not only help us tell the story of CZU, but also of the history of science and taxidermy in the modern day region. Um, so we're super grateful for all the partners and community members who have donated items to our CZU fire collections or participated with us um, in programming our events, and we will continue to look for opportunities to connect our community with collections that better reflect um, you know, what people are experiencing in their daily lives. Um, and so that is the end of my presentation, and I'm going to stop sharing and uh, let Robin introduce Shakira. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Kathleen, and thank you to Jenny. Um, wildfires are obviously not leaving us anytime soon, as are hurricanes. So now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Shakira to talk a little bit about what she's dealt with with uh, preparedness and getting ready for a hurricane season down in Puerto Rico. So Shakira, go ahead whenever you're ready. I'm going to change uh, share screen, share. Let me move this. Hi, everybody. Hola. Welcome here to the hurricane uh, section of stream weather <laughs> information. I call it the always existing hurricane season because I have no way whatsoever try to control the hurricane season living in an island in the middle of the Caribbean. So I have to deal with it every single year. Some days are easier, some seasons are worst. And since already we have been like, it's gonna be five years from Huracan, uh, Huracan Maria uh, uh, this year. So hopefully so far, everything has been very calm in the Atlantic. I'm going to mm -hmm. do my presentation. Also, I always use this slide as my start beginning because it's not only the hurricane season that I have to take care of it. Right now, we are in the midst of the waking again of the earthquakes. We have the heat wave and droughts, and today is a thunderstorm. So also we have to deal with COVID. So we have to be on top every day about our emergency uh, preparedness, emergency dis uh, disaster plans. And this one here the, um, in, the, in the bottom is the National Weather Service from San Juan, Puerto Rico, the one I always have in, in hand following in the social media because that's the one who tell me right away what is coming in the, next, in the following five, uh, five days or so. So I have to check almost these pages <laughs> every two days or so. So is keep me on my toes during these months of the year and everybody at the museum. Uh, okay. So as, uh, um, and this is part, the most important part that I, I use for my planning disaster. Um, and the mitigation preparation response and recovery using these four points is the one i use to prepare my emergency um plan and everything i have to do with the hurricane um season most to keep in mind because i have to use a lot of resources especially uh, human resources and material resources for a lot of things because we are a very small museum. We only have like five people on staff, um, but also we have right now they're entering because the museum is inside the University of Puerto Rico. Now we are recruiting our volunteers. So the training season uh, for their help is going to start soon next week. So to keep on toes because already August 15 is the point, uh, the peak start the peak of the hurricane season. Um, let me see why. Okay, so I'm going to share, you know, just share this slide with you guys so you uh, understand those lines have you seen the top of the map of Puerto Rico and the history of the hurricanes we have. So you have, we are only one, 100 miles by 34 miles of the size of the island. So you can see no matter what, on the size of the hurricane, 
is going to have a direct impact on the island. It's going to be on the coast or inland. It's going to be a direct. Uh, I consider that a direct, a direct damage. So it's important to understand that they, they usually the the high the hurricane season start for June first to November thirtieth. I have to be prepared. I try to be prepared, uh, even for um, in May or April. Um, some things that I can do beforehand because of the size of the staff and the reality are you really we have um, in the peak of the Caribbean in between August right now and the first week of October. So I have to have that in mind, but within my resources, uh, even uh, for budget to buy and the staff I count in that moment. So I'm going to use, you know, a uh, uh, to read all those uh, uh, um, yes, things that I, I write about the hurricane season, but it's very important you know, to understand that I'm a little obsessed with meteorology. So that's why I can read all those things and have it to you. So if I wasn't a registrar, I would be a meteorologist. So that's another story. But <laughs> let me check here. So part of important in the preseason is the mitigation. And I learned how to read the Sapphire Simpson uh, hurricane category scale. Because we in the Puerto Rico, we have one, two, and three categories. Not until Maria, that is the category five, is the first time we have that. So I have to spec for the worst, even though I didn't know what the worst was. So with, within, uh, within our budget, we think we have already uh, used, uh, have worked for us. And beforehand, uh, we have to put it in, in the works. And believe me, that wasn't uh, the case for some areas for us, at least, is was a good thing to do. And it works for our museum. Uh, I always write uh, the tip number one, what this means for you in your area, because we are, I'm in Puerto Rico, I'm in the metropolitan area, I'm in the, cap, in the, capi, um, the capital in San Juan. Uh, we are in a pretty secure area and our buildings, most of the buildings in Puerto Rico, different to other sites or other states, we are uh, in concrete constructions. So that's, the devastation and so areas in the metropolitan area within within have to be buildings was a little smaller and uh, to the other sides of the of the island. So one of the things that I used to learn while during hurricane areas is to use the GIS, the geographic information systems. This page helped me to understand oh where the you the hurricane is if i have a water surge or a storm surge what are you going to stop or where are you going to camp near the museum or the university because the museum is inside the university what is the current water data of puerto rico if i have had a drought what kind of water if i have a fire i have resources near the university and within the university and also we can check uh, the hazards we can have around every time during the day. The United States Geological Service, you can put your state and you can have full, um, uh, a couple of information that can help you to write uh, the, evacu the evacuation plan or the disaster uh, plan or the emergency plan, depending on all your emergencies. It's very important for me and also keep them on my toes. I'm going to share it with you. Oh, wait. I think I have. I lost my slide. Yes. The slide in the bottom I, I, is that you can see like a yellow uh, underline. That is the tsunami damage that could happen in Puerto Rico if we have that event. A little bit on the south uh, is the University of Puerto Rico. So the, the, that line between storm surge or tsunami surge to the university is less than 100 miles um, in the old, yeah, 
So it's very, very, very scary to have that in mind. No matter what is the emergency could happen, it could have that kind of damage. So that also made me to understand where the museum is inside the university, inside the university, and what is the construction and the direction of the wings of a hurricane. So the photograph that you have in the bottom that was in 2017 after Maria, the building you are seeing is the Teatro of the University here in Puerto Rico. And the, uh, this is the 2022 version of the photo. So uh, five years after Maria, at least we have all our foliage back. But it was a very sad thing. I don't have a lot of photos because I lost that, that digital file. And sometimes is uh, being in Puerto Rico in Duri Maria after Maria working in the recovery as an island and in the university. Uh, it it was it was kind of hard. So it's still other things we always say that we have we still have PTSD. A lot of the Puerto Ricans, but we manage because we have to keep going because we decide you know to understand what a hurricane is and get our resources. Then the map that you have on the top is the Hurricane Maria. That was the size of it. So you can see cover all the island. It was uh, over 125 miles per hour and stayed over us over 10 hours. So that direct damage get to us to really uh, understand how long can it be because some hurricanes then more uh like could be two two hours and they're out of the island but this one was very repeatedly so that can stick with you how much is gonna be uh the damage of it so i always have to know why what, what are my reliable reliable resources for the weather updates, of course, the NOAA and the Hurricane Center, our radio stations, our locals, AM, FM, knowing the emergency disaster office area, what are their emergency plans and our emergency plans, statewide, local, and museum. When I say local, I have to also know the university uh, emergency disaster, so I have to put in them together. What I'm, I'm talking about the emergency disasters, uh, the emergency plan is very important to us because, oh, this is this is the slide, it's out of, it's out of space. Uh, the red dot is where the, the University of Puerto Rico is. So now you can see this the tsunami area, the storm area that could happen in the worst case scenario. So I get, uh, get here in the tsunami program tool in the GIS database. So you can see, I can know I can see what is the worst it can happen as today because this map um, uh, change, how you know, you know, climate change, how, how the water and the sea level go within the season. So as you can see in your right when below is the say tsunami storm is the, is the airport, the main airport of the island. So you can see at some point it can be underwater. So they have to have a new um, emergency plan to know where the other two uh, possible airports can happen in the next 10 years because this is a concern right now. Um, so as you can see, the University of Puerto Rico is the red dot. I'm very clear to very uh, near to that damaged area and also is a very important area because we can go inland or we can move to one side to the other if I have to move collections. Uh, right now, we don't move any collections outside of our building during the hurricane season. This is a secure uh, building uh, so far. Uh, so, and within the university, we have another building that maybe can work for us as uh, as as our storage, and also we we work as a uh, storage for a lot of collections within the university. So we have to be able to provide that kind of secure for the collection, especially for the library, use the building right next to us. So I try to prioritize the emergency. You can see the first uh, the first slide. I have the you know, the COVID and the earthquakes, 
So I have to be in top. So what we mean by preventive procedures uh, to have on hand, how many staff do I have each time of this emergency? What are my equipment supplies? Do I have outside help? What do I need right now? So the most important photo that I can control is the emergency evaluation plan. So I can know what is my actual capability of acquired materials and also to uh, training our day, my plan with the, the staff I have right now, we have right now in the university, I'm, I mean, in the museum and also the university staff. Uh, this is the one of the most important uh, tools that we have. If you don't have an emergency uh, disaster plan, the prep uh, is very important, the pocket response plans, because uh, make you write down to sit down and, and table read with your staff, which are our phones, who are the person closest to the, to the university, who, the, who have the keys to enter to the museums, or the security codes if we have, you know, electric, uh, electric power. Uh, what kind of first responders are gonna be? How many do, what, what do I have to call to enter to understand what is the emergency uh, in, the, in the museum at that time of the, after the hurricane? So that's why it's always a pre-season preparation. That's why I have the, the the check on the top of the each slides that uh, made me to understand in that moment of preparation, I had to have the prep. But also, this is the backside of the prep. Uh, so you have to coordinate your responses, what's gonna be my salvage recovery materials, if I need to, where do I can obtain more information, more helps. So it's very important to know and very uh, be familiarized with this with this document. Uh, this is a reference for our uh, for the museum history and body or emergency plan. I have uh, icons. Um, obviously, right now this is in Spanish. I will, you know, where I can put now the health trust and the health trust. They have just you know, Sara don't events epidemic. Uh, the pandemic epidemic. You know, that kind of stuff is right now is on the works. So. And so no other, you know, hurricane, because hurricanes is, as you can see, is in the first page because of incidents is a very important, the order of the uh, emergency. So right now, after our communication plan will be the floods, fire and earthquakes, and then going to be um, hurricanes and thunders, uh, storms. And the other part is the one is the server, the salvage and recommended procedure is also in our emergency disaster plan. Uh, in this image I, is the tip number two, we have to checklist. I do the checklist everything. What is my material do I have? So the disaster kits are very important. There are a lot of pages so you can create your own uh you can go to believe me from uh always 99 to a dollar store to get most of things because most of most of them you can get the most fancy one because most of them they're gonna be damaged at the end of the emergency or the recovery part so you have a broom a mop a, a bucket um a towels everything that you can have low budget because it's gonna help you at some point so it's very important to have i have a rack ready to all um to all uh, to plastic sheeting to sandbags uh, to all bedding because the old bedding is very important it can be like a water barrier and the bedding is um you know you we change it we don't know what to do with them maybe are it's not the best one but it's the cheapest one for get resources so it's very important to understand what i can use and what i can have to and that and the uh, uh, comforters, when I call it, that's the most helpful because I can put it inside our storage or outside the art storage or around some of the some of the collections or the sculptures, for example. There's another photo where you know I have my volunteer. This photo was taken before Hurricane Maria. And the photo on the bottom is the art storage um, door. We create a, a barrier like a dam 
with plastic sheeting and sandbags because that area was just in front from a lot of windows. So if the windows broke, I know that was very one of my wicked spots. So it's very important to know um, the construction. And you know, some museums they use the the building. They use the building because they look new. They uh, they, look, they look nice, and they design it. But maybe it wasn't designed to be a museum. So you have to you know work with what you have. Uh, what are the checklists? You have to have the documents, all the documents, and that is also the records of the works of art. Uh, all the collections are in the cloud right now. I have inventories, a very simple Excel, Excel um, sheet when I have age, uh, uh, when I have date and numbers, uh, session numbers, where, where, where was the location and that information and where's, um, and any other uh, very uh, delicate point of that work. But I don't move, uh, and, collection from, from the art stories to outside the museum. Uh, what are the volunteers? You have to put where account with pre um, storms or, or after the event, the resources. When I put food and water, it's not only for your staff, for you and in your house. It's very important because that go with the mental health. And it's very important. I know the other um, panelists have mentioned it. This is very important because we are we can go anywhere. We have to stay inside the island because the airports um, uh, close, I think, within 20, uh, 48 hours uh, before a hurricane. So there's no way you can go outside if we have this event. So we have to mental uh, check uh, what we have, what, what we have to work within the museum and with our houses. Right now, this is the Atlantic hurricane season outlook. So far, they, they didn't change it in the last two weeks. So they're still expecting six to 10 hurricanes and three to stick con turn into major hurricanes. So far, it has been very, very, very silent, kind of creepy, but I can work with that. So uh, the documents in the cloud, how I see in your office, how and disaster kit, get the call tree, the collections, location plan is gonna be various copy, but limited because it's also security breach. You have to know who is going to have this information or where was your collection or your more precious painting in one art story. So also you have to have control of that. That was the inventory and condition report forms. You can uh, print that print out beforehand those. And I have a couple, uh, I have the forms in the clouds. So if I find a place that I can have uh, electrical, uh, um, supply because in the last hurricane, for example, in the museum, uh, we spent four months without electricity. So we have to work and get all the documents and information from the collections and know the conservation of them because I want those registers that still have the collections in wrecking and record cards. So I know where is the collection, the um, accession number, and the localization of the of the object with this, and that is the 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 archives uh, that is in the back. So if they are in my office, they are waterproof and fireproof. That's one control I can have, but also they have digital copies in the cloud. Uh, the damage assessment forms are very important to have also beforehand. All those are an institutional, for example, here the, uh, the museum, but also you have to know those famous standards they, because if you have a damage, you have to do to report that damage and you will know beforehand how they are designed. It's easier for you to understand and fill out those forms. So it's very important also create your, your own institutional damage assessment forms, you know, know the other that you will end up feeling anyway. 
pre-season preparation, as you can see, these are my inside hole uh, sculptures. Those can be moved. So I use plastic sheeting tape and stretch wrap. Stretch wrap, I, had, I have a no, is the best one ever because doesn't, if you use tape, the high humidity in percentage in Puerto Rico, the adhesive won't work. So is the stretch wrap who work for me is going to stay in and they're going to get stickier with more humidity. So this is a very tip, a very good tip to get your um, sculptures um, wrap around to protect, at least have one protection in the outside of the uh, outside because they are going to be outside in the in the hole. So that's very important. Also, when you have volunteers, no one you haven't, you have a high two days beforehand, I'm going to use them. I'm going to, I'm going to grab the sculptures. I don't care if I watch or is this a warning, I'm going to do it anyway. Knowing the difference between watch and warning is very important because in the, for example, in our emergency plan, I know things that I have to do during a watch. I know things that I have to do during a warning. So that's the time to activate the disaster emergency plan. Talk about uh, the staff situation, uh, museum-wise, home-wise, because I live um, 10 minutes from the museum, but some people can live one hour from the museum. So you know with that person is gonna be outside, is gonna be, you know, out of your um, first responder in the in the museum just you know for security purposes. You have to reinforce in that moment the communication system for us during Maria, the after Maria, the one it works, it was a simple sheet put it in the door grading, hi, I'm Shakira, I came inside the museum and 10.30, I checked this, 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 because there weren't any cell phones. We don't have tel satellite cell phones. So, and I know, I know who person came inside the museum and do what, and then I can pick, it, pick up that, be, uh, pick up uh, that uh, work and keep going in, inside the, um, the evaluation and the assessment of the collection after that. So as simple as a paper putting with tape on the door is work as a communication system. To understand my actual tip, after the power loss was a very, uh, um, it was the most stressful for me because we have high humidity. We all have uh, the stream, the hot, the sun and the heat was very um, high after Maria. So we have uh, some structural damage. So we have to put, have you seen the photograph? Uh, those are the windows in front of our storage. So I put rolls of white paper so I can deflect a little bit of the sun and the heat from that hole. So I can breathe a little bit so I can open the doors and have to work within the on our storage because we have no electricity. So I work with a headlamp inside to do the accessments of the collections. I still have uh, another tip that I use. I know this is, you know, um, legal or not, but the expandable foam for the sealed doors in the bottom of the emergency doors work for us is like a barrier that you can take it after with a little bit of thinner and you can de uh, dilute that foam but that is an amazing water um, um, stopper to go inside and under the doors with a very fine line we still use it when i have you know a storm uh, a storm is coming that's the first thing right now that i bought for, for my emergency uh, materials. So is uh, that's what I'm going to share with you. I hope it works. <laughs> and post event the recovery for us, it can take from six months to five years. I put five years and counting, but we still haven't managed a damage from Hurricane Maria uh, in the museum. Thank Godly, we didn't have any uh, damage within the collections. 
uh, there was no water leakage inside the art storage, and there were only very small structural damage within us. So that's why uh, I can get to go and, and help other museums to recover the collections. Right now, the local um, cultural emergency group, the Alianza Cultural para Emergencia, was created after Hurricane Maria. And we are right now eight members that we take the classes in uh, the certification from HENTEF and the, the Missonia Rescue Initiative. So because we learned importance for us uh, in Puerto Rico to understand and create the emergency plan. And that was our first year to, to be created in the Alianza Cultural para Emergencia was to teach everybody to have a pocket plan while they have the, nation, uh, the initiation to create their own emergency plan disaster. And also it's very important to create all this information and bibliography in Spanish and other languages because it's very important you know, to have the broader on the information. So that was our main thing to create all those things in, in Espanol for all those Spanish speakers and emergency planners to have these tools to uh, these tools for to do it. So this is the, also the natural groups and there are two, two books also that I have used to read to create all my information. Uh, and they are in the biography section that I sent to Robin. So you can also have it. And I think that's my presentation. Thanks, Shakira. I should add to that um, part of the IMLS grant that C2C Care just got with FAIC was to provide uh, more Spanish translations of all the C2C Care webinars. So that was a huge part of the grant that we wanted to cover. So we're excited about that aspect as well. Well, I'm going to take a look at the Q&A box. Jenny's been doing a bang up job <laughs> hitting all those questions in the Q&A box. So thank you for doing that. But we're going to talk a little generically about some items um, in our last couple of minutes. You all did wonderful. So thank you again on covering those topics. Um, the one thing I wanted to cover with all of you were just evacuations. Um, like Shakira was talking about, you know, there in Puerto Rico, and I had this experience in Florida. Sometimes you, you have nowhere to evacuate to, right? <laughs> like you look and you're kind of like, Hurricane's gonna hit us and like there's really nowhere to go. But I, I yeah, exactly. But I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, there are some cases where you can do low scale um, evacuations. How do you all, do you all have priority lists or do you have certain items that you look at that if it hits an evacuation, you know how to go about? And how did you come up with some of those priorities um, within your collection? So I'm gonna shoot over to Jenny first and see if she has an answer for that. Yeah, so um, at the time, no, we didn't have priority lists. I think now I know priority lists are very, very helpful. Um, I think our, uh, since I wasn't there present at all of the parks that were being evacuated, you know, I was only at Wilder Ranch, so it was the other staff evacuating. And I think it would seem that it was just very intuitive what people grabbed. You know, they tried to pack as much that was on display. And then the interpretive staff knew about items in storage and grabbed those. Um, we fortunately in our district, we do have a bunch of parks. There are 32 parks in the whole district. And so we did have that resource of having other places to evacuate to. You know, the fire was in the mountains. And so we were trying to get things out of the mountains, which is why we then moved things to the Santa Cruz Mission, which is right in the middle of downtown Santa Cruz, basically. Um, so yeah, uh, how, you know, like I said, I think how people decided to choose what to grab was just very instinctual mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, now we know to <laughs> come up with more priority lists. Yeah. Shakira, do you have any comments on priority lists or I know, cause like I said, low scale evacuation can even be, you know, to move some things from one location to another, cause it might be just you know, safer in that situation. What do you, what is your guys' experience with that? Uh, for example, I tend to secure uh, the most important, uh, for example, in the art storage, in the painting storage, the most important out in the center of the, of the racks. Um, there, because they are the biggest racks. So I, if I have to move it, that will be the first. Yes, we have a priority list because it's just the university mm -hmm. may must do, uh, make us do it. But it's between our art, art objects, archaeological objects, historic objects. So everything have a priority list. 
but within the emergency, I try to contain everything inside the art storage because, and in you have the priority. Um, uh, um, I think it's uh, uh, there's not a drawing that I always use in my class uh, that you have from the building to the to the storage to the to the. To, you know, to everything within to the object. So I try to do that because I don't have anywhere to move those. So, but yes, we have a plan and also the curator have their favorite object. I mean, the most important objects, so you have to take care of it, uh, but uh, they are graded, but I don't put it inside the emergency plan because mm -hmm. everything has to be controlled within, within, the, within that idea to protect everything. Right. And also, I forgot to say one of the things I try to work but haven't worked yet is to change the the uh, the calendar for exhibition, not to have big loans uh, mm. in, in, during hurricane season, but mm, still working. On that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and someone pointed that out in the chat, and that's always been my rule: is that loaned items usually get the highest priority, right? Yes, because they, they are. Do ours <laughs> like they are being putting into our trust so that's one thing you have to consider when looking at it is loaned items are always the highest tend to always almost have a highest priority within the uh the list of, of things to be moved um the other thing i wanted to touch upon in our last couple minutes is just what i always call the people factor but it does feel like you know when it comes to mental health and really looking at these things it looks like everyone had varied response on what kind of mental health sources that they had or if their governing institutions gave them kind of like mental uh, sources to kind of help them with things. Do you guys have any comments on just how it's come about? I know I, after Irma, we definitely had PTSD after it. I mean, just driving through a, a, a hurricane landscape and driving through National Guard and be, kind of being like, what is happening to our little island home? You know what I mean? It, it, it hit us in very different ways. So do you guys have any comments on that factor or sources, you know, about that might be helpful to people? Yeah, I think I wrote in the chat that, you know, there had been a, a district-wide um, emotional support session scheduled for some reason I can't remember why I wasn't able to go to it mm -hmm. it was also like I said you know peak COVID time so I think a lot of people didn't go because it was going to be an in-person session this must have been in September of 2020 you know and, and I think a lot of people did avoid it um, and that was pretty much the only emotional resources I was aware of but like I wrote you know um, at least 20 state park staff housing units were destroyed at Big Basin. Mm -hmm. So the main focus, I think, of our, uh, of our district wide resources were on supporting those people who lost their houses. And, and I mm -hmm. and I really understand why. Um, there were some financial resources that were available for people who were um, who lost their houses or were evacuated. I actually did benefit from a small grant from our friends organization because you know I was evacuated for five weeks and had to pay rent and you know basically in two places. Um, so but yeah emotional I definitely feel like I have a little PTSD, you know, you know, we just had another lightning dry lightning storm come through like within the last couple days and it it causes a lot of PTSD around here still. Um, so yeah, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Yeah. Anybody else have any other resources they found useful? I, I will quickly say if you guys can, if we're thinking of some, it's just talking to some of my friends who have dealt with it was really useful too. I mean, now with the world of Zoom, knowing other people have gone through it, it was quite helpful just speaking to them in person. So, um, oh, someone just, oh, go ahead, Kathleen. Oh, I was going to say, I think that that is something that we found with a lot of our like post-disaster programming is that people do just benefit a lot from talking about this stuff and being able to have an opportunity to tell these stories. Um, and so having like, we constantly had like a fire resources um, up for like, I think about a year um, after the original fires with like different community resources, like volunteering initiatives, which like people express feeling really connected to other folks through and then doing programming where people could then come into the chat and talk about their experiences. Yeah, that's great. Um, so a question popped in, which I think is a good wrap up question real quick, which is our museum 
does not have an emergency plan. And they said, I know <laughs> any idea where I can find a good example. So I would like each of you to tell me what your favorite resource was or is in developing emergency plans. So Shakira, can you go first and tell us what your favorite resource is in developing emergency plans? My, uh, our emergency plan was a part of no, for example, because we are within the University of Puerto Rico. So using the University of Puerto Rico campus, make campus emergency plan, help me to make mine. And also because we are a um, accreditation museum. So I have to know to put another things inside. So always read as if I'm a, if I'm a university museum, I will look for a university museum emergency plan because we have mm -hmm. another things. If you have a historical or you have a science museum. So because you have another collections and other things to, to to go through. So it's the collections that make me, uh, that make me help to make my emergency plan. And also my location, uh, geographical, uh, where I am inside the, the, uh, the island. Because we have, we are very small, but we have very different weather during the, uh, during mm -hmm. the day. So also it's very important. So that also helped me a lot. So just read a lot, even now, and I read for Maine, for Pittsburgh, to Florida, to, Cal to Colombia and Chile because of the different weather um, um, and also collections. So I have yeah. all over from Latin America to read uh, examples to it. Perfect. Yeah. And that's a good point that if you're part of a system, make sure that your plan talks to the other plans. <laughs> don't, don't, pick, don't write your own little plan over in the corner. You gotta, you gotta talk to those other plans as well. Kathleen, what's your favorite source when it comes to developing emergency plans? Um, I saw that Faith in the chat put a reference to the national, the Northeast Document Conservation Center's mm -hmm. suite of resources, which were incredible. Um, I was lucky enough to take their course about improving our emergency plan after we wrote it. It was super helpful and really emphasized like talking to other um, museums and collections holding institutions in your community. Um, so I've benefited a lot from that, um, but Faith already put that. So I will also say that um, National Park Service makes available their museum handbook um, publicly. And um, there I scavenged a lot of pieces of their um, emergency plan chapter for writing mine. Perfect. And Jenny, what's your favorite resource when it comes to emergency plans? Yeah, I so um, since I am part of a large state entity, the state parks. I do get a lot of resources from our, our main collection staff that are up in Sacramento, but I'm pretty sure that all of their emergency plans also come from the National Park Service Museum Handbook. And that Good. just in general, that national, or for me, for, my, for our types of collections, that National Park Service Handbook comes in really helpful for a lot of things. Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of people use that as a reference. I'll also say the Getty has a good handbook um, for emergency planning that I would recommend to people that's online. I know that, I think, yes, any DCC came up with DPLAN 2.0, which is an online template that you can use to help develop plans. So um, I would definitely say, go to our website, connectingtocollections.org, type in emergency planning, you'll find all sorts of fun stuff. Also, FAIC's just emergency section has really good resources when it comes to emergency plans. Well, it's 2.35 Eastern, so I have to wrap up today's program. Um, I'm just gonna also say for a real quick takeaway that all of you mentioned, or you know, and definitely Shakira and Kathleen, I think you too, Jenny, you all work with relatively smaller staff, right? Um, it's not, you're not in these institutions with 20 some odd people. And it's really impressive to me how you guys really thought out your plans, how you really thought about how to prepare. It's a lot of forward thinking, but I think the takeaways you guys did when dealing with your types of extreme weather were also incredibly important. So well done. And we hope that people will reach out to you all directly if they have more specific questions on how planning happens, okay? Um, I'm going to also note that on our website on connectingtocollections.org, you can see uh, fabulous resources that these folks have put together. We have a resource sheet, we have notes from the presentations and copies of the presentations. So if you go to that webpage, you will be able to find those. So again, thank you to all three of you. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will see you all soon. Thanks to IMLS, thanks to FAIC, and also our, the folks at Learning Times. We hope everyone stays safe, that the hurricane stays relatively quiet, but we know there's other disasters and weather out there. So if everyone, please stay safe and know that we have a great community out here to reach out if you need help in any way, shape, or form. 
thanks again and we will see you all in September. Talk to you soon. Bye.